diversity net gain achievable. Um, and I've sort of deliberately left this introductory slide so I'm quite blank. I haven't put any nice images of um, greened up quarries or quarries looking um, pretty stark and um, working quarries of machinery. I've just left that blank. So, so as we go through this presentation, um, it will sort of bring to the fore um, the issues of biodiversity and particularly the issues associated with the, the quarrying industry. So bearing in mind, this is um, a similar um, lecture that I, I give to my students when we're talking about things like corporate sustainability, environmental management and environmental practice. Um, but I've sort of tweaked it a little bit to sort of try and make it um, more applicable to, to, to this audience. So I'll just carry on and um, we can have a, a discussion at the end. So. I'm very happy to answer your questions or any of the things that um, I talk about this afternoon. So, just advance a slide. That's not moving now. Let me see. Why isn't that moving? Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, okay, so just a brief um, introduction. Um, I know Steve uh, said a little bit about my background, um, but I'm uh, at the moment um, a senior lecturer in conservation biology at Bath Spa University and course leader for environmental science. Um, I'm also the professional placement year tutor for biology, environmental science and wildlife conservation. So very keen on embedding employability within the, within the curriculum. Um, I've been a member of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management now since 1993. I'm a chartered environmentalist through the Society of Environment, and I have a strong background in professional environmental consultancy, I'm working mainly with clients in the middle, minerals industry sector, but other clients as well um, from different, different sectors. So what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is really um, sort of the background to the development of approaches to biodiversity. And obviously biodiversity is closely linked to the, um, the concept of sustainable development. I'm going to look at the green agenda and also discuss key drivers of biodiversity loss, um, which we hear a lot about um, in the news. It's something that's coming at us all the time. And, um, you, I'm sure you've all heard the, the, the comment that Britain or UK is one of the most depleted countries in the world in terms of its biodiversity loss. Um, talking also about environmental impacts, particularly those associated with the quarrying industry, approaches to achieving biodiversity net gain, and a few case studies. So case studies that I've worked on personally or have personal knowledge of through my, um, through my work. Um, okay, so to start off with just a few um, sort of definitions or principles to talk a little bit about what is sustainable development, what do we mean by sustainable development? Well, that quote there is something that comes up all the time, um, the United Nations General Assembly. Their definition is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's, that's the most commonly held definition. What is sustainable development? Um, and most major companies now will refer to their sustainability credentials um, on their various websites. And this green agenda has now become the norm if a business is perceived as sustainable and almost having a license to practice. The green agenda is, is sort of becoming more and more important um, in business. As we move towards a more circular economy, um, a circular economy is that approach to um, economics that looks at cradle to grave impacts rather than a linear, linear economy um, that you, know, you buy something, you use something, you throw something away. The circular economy is a more sustainable approach to, to doing business. So the second definition really is biodiversity net gain. I'm sure you've, you've heard all about this, particularly um, uh, with the new DEFRA metric. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how this applies to biodiversity net gain. Um, and if we take this definition here, biodiversity net gain is an approach to development and or land management that aims to leave the natural environment in a measurably better state than it was beforehand. So you can see there's very strong relationship there between biodiversity net gain and this idea of sustainable development. So um, biodiversity there is um, a contraction of biological diversity. 
But what do we mean by biological diversity? Well, it's really the whole variety of living organisms. So it's not just animals and insects and plants, it's also bacteria and fungi as well. Um, so it can also refer to biodiversity of soils as well. So it can come right the way down to microorganisms. And when we're talking about habitats as well, because habitats are the units that we're interested in. Um, and these are the areas um, and resources that are used by um, living organisms or assemblages of animals and plants. That's um, definitions there from the local government association. Um, there is a, a very short, I think it's about a five minute video from Natural England and it introduces you to the concept of biodiversity net gain. It's quite simplistic. I did try to play it, but I'm not brave enough to do it within this presentation because we had a few problems getting back to the slides. So what I've done is I posted it in the chat um, so it will be made available. Sarah can make that available to you if you want, want to look at it. But it, it's very simplistic infographics of what biodiversity net gain is if you wanted to find out a little bit more about it um, in, in just, just get an overview of what it is. Um, but continuing on with a few basic principles, this is um, something that I'm sure you're familiar with, the sort of the mitigation hierarchy, um, where you go from um, the order of preference in the green at the top is avoiding, avoiding impacts of biodiversity to mitigating impacts of biodiversity. If you can't do those, then you compensate for um, the impacts on biodiversity. So basically development should protect existing habitats and ecosystems, protects um, what's there that's of value. Um, and in order to do that, you need to know what's there. So you need to have your baseline surveys. These are usually carried out by specialist ecologists, environmentalists, um, and it will follow the principles of the mitigation hierarchy. Um, and coming back to what's been driving this, it's basically um, the Environment Act of 2021, quite recent piece of legislation. And this now makes achieving biodiversity net gain mandatory with a target of a minimum of 10% biodiversity net gain from the baseline, that is. Um, and how is that going to be measured? It's applied and measured through something called the DEFRA biodiversity metric, which has been tested, been tested for a while now, um, but we're moving nearer to it becoming mandatory. Uh, the latest dates are November 2023. I think we just finished a period of final consultation on that. Um, and the idea is, is that it will measure improvements for biodiversity by creating and enhancing habitats in association with development. And it can be achieved either on-site or off-site or through a combination of off and on-site measures. So you may have heard of things of habitat banking and environmental credits and all this, but it's all very new. I'm not claiming here at all to be an expert in the use of the metric. Um, I know the basic principles of it, but I haven't been involved in the actual testing of it. But the most important thing is that it is coming. Um, and November 23, it will become um, uh, mandatory under the Environment Act 2021. So I've mentioned about the consultation that um, on August 2022, the final consultation was um, um, proposed um, for version four, and that will be the final version. As I said, it will be adopted in England by the Secretary of State from November 2023. And I know that um, the Mineral Products Association, um, the MPA, has been um, working um, it, with the consultation to sort of argue that mineral extraction is kind of different to other types of development and the metric does need to include values that are appropriate for mineral development as well. Um, there are some habitat units perhaps that um, are not applicable, certainly things like, um, I mean that are missing perhaps, things like um, open disturbed ground, early successional habitats may not have the same value in the metric. Um, as something like 
woodland or hedgerows or streams or rivers. So it all depends on the habitat units that are going to be applied. Um, so that's something that is that is ongoing. Um, and there have been a few amendments to metric, but I think that we're sort of stuck with, with version four when it comes out. Um, the reason that it um, has been developed is that it was seen really that despite existing legislation, um, things like the NERC Act 2006 and the National Planning Policy Framework, that there were still losses to biodiversity. They continued across the board um, despite this approach, which was no net loss. Um, so it was sort of adding to that. The idea is that it would add to that it would, and it would push for biodiversity net gain as opposed to no net loss. Um, so again, as I said, it will be mandatory and finalized as version four from November, 2023. So, this brings us on really to the key drivers of biodiversity loss. Um, this is from the, this infographic is from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And it looks at these key drivers on the planet um, and on people. So the indirect impacts there are socio-economic and demographic trends, um, maybe people disconnecting with nature or a lack of understanding of the importance of nature. Um, I think for all of us, this um, maybe was brought home during the pandemic when we were more restricted to where we could go and getting out in nature on our doorstep became very important. So it may have pushed up that appreciation of natural habitats within our local area. Um, and all these other indirect effects, um, culture and government, obviously there has to be a culture for biodiversity, um, enhancement and, and value. Um, but other things that are driving biodiversity loss are the direct um, drivers like land use change, climate change, pollution, natural resource use, exploitation, invasive species. So the two in bold there are probably the two that are most relevant to um, the quarrying industry. So, I'm just looking about it in a bit more detail there. Um, the State of Nature report that you may or may not be aware of, um, the last, the latest one was published in 2019. Um, this State of Nature report of 2019 suggests that there's been a 13% decline in the average abundance of wildlife in the UK since the 1970s. And as I said, it's despite the legislation that we've had in place to um, protect biodiversity and wildlife. So I've taken, that's an, an infographic sort of, well, of everything, all the main points that have come out of that um, uh, State of Nature report. But you can see that the, the, the things that are driving um, change in England are those um, uh, things, those developments like agricultural management, freshwater management, invasive non-native species. But, if you look very carefully there, you can see just on the on the um, the smaller um, picture there that 69% of change to biodiversity has come from um, changing agricultural management. That's agriculture as a major driver for biodiversity loss. Um, the others are relatively minor compared to the impact of um, agricultural change and farming. Um, on the landscape, on the environment, and on, on biodiversity. So, um, looking at policy and legislative frameworks, I suppose to put it into context, then the need, we, we, we need to understand obviously the need for quarrying, to put it into perspective, into the context um, of quarrying industry provisioning national infrastructure projects. And you probably know much more about this than I do, but just a few examples. Um, Hinkley Point C, um, thousands of tons of aggregates, 
um, I think that's from Hanson's Quarry in Botley Quarry near, near where I live actually in Froome, um, transported by sea to the site of EDF Energy's Hinkley Point C. Um, and now the jetty is fully operational. Um, this will um, obviously reduce the amount of lorry journeys, which means there'll be less disruption to local community, less in terms of carbon emissions um, throughout the course of the construction. So that's a major infrastructure project. Another one, um, uh, Raymond Brown were involved with the tallest wind turbines in the UK, and that's back in February 2015. Um, they were contracted to build the foundations for two new wind turbines near Aylesbury. And I believe these new wind turbines were about 20 metres taller than other wind turbines. Um, and again, so you've got nuclear energy, you've got wind power, um, the materials for these alternative energies um, are coming from the quarrying industry, the foundations for these um, infrastructure projects that will presumably help drive us towards um, net zero in 2030 or, or 2050 globally. Um, nuclear energy may be a little bit more controversial there, um, but it is still um, one of the sources of energy that is being um, pushed forward as we move away from dependence on fossil fuels. So tarmac also, um, we're involved in producing specialised noise reducing, um, spray reducing surfacing um, on road systems. Um, there was a big one near East Cheshire. Um, and of course, we've got aggregate industries involved in heat expansion projects. These major infrastructure projects really establish the need for quarrying, but there have been concerns about environmental impacts of the industry. They've been around for a long time. Um, and generally, these have been addressed by good practice, industry-wide standards, there's been planning policy, frameworks, legislation, and of course, the planning system where planning consents are required environmental impact assessments, environmental statements, all these required under Town and Country Planning Act, um, sometimes mandate, mandatory, uh, generally quarrying falls within the mandatory need for environmental impact assessments due to the size of the developments. Um, but often they are put forward um, voluntarily for certain developments where they may not be required. Um, there's a new sort of framework standard for the responsible sourcing of construction product, um, products. That's something you may not have heard about. That's BES 6001. Um, and obviously, the Environment Act of 2021 will be pulling all these various bits of legislation together. So, environmental impacts of quarrying. Sustainable or not? Um, air pollution. Uh, the things that have been managed or are managed um, as part of environmental management systems will be things like air pollution, that's dust in ambient air, um, alkaline or acid dusts, which can have effects on health environment. There's noise pollution from processing facilities, infrastructure, extraction processes, biodiversity impacts of habitats, hydrological impacts, quarry waste, generally inert, um, but you've also got where you've got dewatering operations going on, you have suspended particles in water. So that's the whole um, sort of scenario of environmental impacts that have been associated with, with quarrying. So how have they been managed? How have they been managed um, up to now? Um, through sustainability, corporate responsibility, environmental management systems. The one that um, is most well known is ISO 14001. Um, and um, many companies, including quarry companies, are now accredited to this standard. Biodiversity action plans have been around for a long time. Um, many quarries will have their own biodiversity action plan where it looks at targets for achieving um, biodiversity gain um, and protecting existing habitats and species that are known to be within those um, not just development footprints, per peripheral areas, also other land holdings that are owned by, by the companies may have areas on them that are significant for nature conservation. So biodiversity action plans have been part of this approach, this corporate responsible approach um, for a long time. 
Um, and again, coming back to this idea of corporate social responsibility, working to a sort circular economy, working with stakeholders, various community initiatives, and um, you know, the focus on ecosystem services. Um, there's an infographic there that sort of explains what ecosystem services are, but basically um, ecosystem services are what does nature actually do for us? And they're regulating um, um, services, there are provisioning services from clean air to clean water to soil. So it's this sort of view of um, the whole system as such and, and how Quarrying will fit within that scenario of ecosystem services. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit now about some case studies that, that I've been involved with. Um, how these can um, achieve um, biodiversity net gain um, on some sites and um, some specific projects in specific areas that are leading to enhancement of habitats and protection of species. This one here, so excuse me, <coughs> is um, Binnega Quarry. Um, in Dorset, and um, Raymond Brown and Suez were, excuse me, Raymond Brown and, and Suez were granted the planning permission in May 2016 for a major extension south of Puddleton, Puddletown Road. Um, and this is for over 2.5 million tonnes of sand and gravel, and that will be worked um, over the next 10 to 15 years. And part of this was um, restoring the used workings or the finished workings to this mix of heathland, wetland um, and woodland. <clears throat> so it was a major project to enhance and extend lowland heathland in conjunction with um, licensed translocation of a, a rare plant called Penny Royal, a mentha pugilium. Um, it's endangered in the UK. It's at the most northern end of its range, of its range but it's everywhere at Binnega. There's a lot of it about. Um, but um, it was moved to an area that was created, um, as you can see there on the map um, in the bottom left-hand corner, that's the overall um, sort of view of the site with the Heathland restoration areas there in the north. Um, and you've got a, a, a picture there of 2014, how it looked when it was land formed and created there. Um, you can see some temporary pools were created, um, the various areas, flat areas, undulating areas. And the slide to the right there shows that same area. This has been monitored through fixed point photography in 2020. So it's only six years on and there's been sort of transformation there. And the pools are um, good for invertebrates, um, as well as penny royal thriving around these um, Sort of ephemeral pools where it's sort of a, a bit wet, a bit poorly drained. Um, so yeah, a, a successful, a successful habitat restoration project that has enhanced that area for um, uh, early successional heathland habitats and rare plant species. Um, so the reason Penny Royal is doing so well there um, is that it's dependent on um, very open conditions. And these open early successional conditions are found on uh, short disturbed turf or sparsely vegetated tracks. And as I said, it's confined to areas that are generally inundated or at least they're damp in winter, such as hollows and wheel ruts. So if you didn't have disturbance on these sites, you wouldn't get the species. The same is true for some um, areas on, on, on sandy areas, um, in tank ruts, areas of heathland that have been disturbed through military manoeuvres um, for a long time and um, have high populations of quite rare club moss growing in the tank ruts on sort of exposed peaty subsoils. So it's disturbance that's creating these areas. Um, so um, unless you're creating these areas specifically from scratch, like, as, like has been done here, they would be um, dependent on high, either high levels of grazing or trampling by large livestock or 
gross disturbance such as heavy machinery moving about like the, like the tanks or quarry vehicles um, but importantly where it's lost it may still be there in the seed bank so as soon as you open up these habitats through disturbance the species can make um, a comeback so it's been successful in restoring these populations of this uh, rare plant to these areas of, of restored heathland and that vinegar so that that pond there that water body, some of them may dry up um, in the summer, some of them may be there all year round, um, but they have um, uh, over 80% cover now in vegetation. I should have said from virtually zero in 2014 to 2020, and I've got over 80% vegetation cover there. Um, you've got breeding dragonflies, pennyroyal is abundant um, on the margins of that sort of water bodies there. You've got dense rush, growth, um, diverse sedges. Um, so you've got a lot of biodiversity there. But in addition to that, you do have things like gorse or birch and other things coming in, lots of bracken that are not necessarily the target species. So there is a need for continued management of these areas to maintain their biodiversity interest. So that's one example of, of the site um, that resulted in biodiversity gain over quite a large area of um, early successional open heathland and acid grassland. So another one I was involved with um, is a chicken sobri um, quarry in South Gloucestershire. There's some um, um, images there of um, the biodiversity or the, the protected species that we were, were dealing with there. Um, it's a, a complex of carboniferous limestone quarries, again, producing over a million tonnes of aggregate per year. And on this site, there's a whole um, complex of geological triple SIs, local nature conservation sites, and on old waste tips, um, there are a series of sort of ponds, open water, that was found during the baseline surveys to have quite significant populations of great crested newts. And you can see some of those there um, in the top left-hand corner. Um, interestingly, they're quite long-lived animals. So that's a female there in the bottom left. It's quite a lot larger than some of the smaller animals there. Um, but again, that's a, a protected species, a European protected species, so subject to licensing constraints where it does occur. Um, so on this site, um, there's a major mitigation project, and it, it turned out that the area of the old tip where the ponds were, where all the newts were, where all the biodiversity was focused, um, was actually left um, as a nature conservation site. And other areas, it was mainly terrestrial habitat that was being affected, so obviously the, the material from the, um, the quarry had to be put somewhere. So new waste tip areas were created, which meant there was quite a significant loss of terrestrial habitat. So new terrestrial habitat had to be created, um, things like unimproved grassland, new hedgerows, uh, tree planting, um, as well as this focus on the pond area. And in addition, new ponds as well um, were created um, to allow the population um, centered on the original ponds to move and colonize these, these new ponds. Um, and been very successful. The, the newts are now breeding in all of the new water bodies um, and the population seems to be pretty stable. Um, so monitoring at this site has continued um, for, I think we've had at least 10 years of monitoring now. Um, it's a long-term um, quarry that will be having uh, quarrying uh, areas brought into production um, over quite long periods of time. So the monitoring on this site is quite long term. Um, newts are important there, but also um, other species uh, were found to be using the site. Do any of you recognize that, um, um, I suppose, the poo in that picture there, um, <laughs> to the right to the right of the newts? Um, that's another rare species that's using that site much to our surprise, <laughs> which resulted in further mitigation. It's otter sprint, and those otters are eating crayfish, um, not our native crayfish, because they're virtually extinct now, only in um, uh, areas where they can be protected from 
uh, alien species of crayfish entering the catchment, do we still get great, um, do we still get our native white clawed crayfish? But the otters don't care whether they're native or whether they're introduced, they're, it's still food source. Um, so they'll be happily munching away on a non-native crayfish species. So the haul road that crossed from the tipping area at that site to the, um, the working area, the new planned area at that time, had to have um, a bridge and a culvert built there with areas um, that would allow the otters to pass through um, on these ledges um, underneath the haul road, part of mitigation um, for this protected species there. And we know the otters are using them because we had cameras up there and we recorded one going through. We also had spraint um, on the ledges there as well, otter spraint. So yeah, again, um, successful uh, mitigation and biodiversity, um, definitely more than no net loss in this situation, biodiversity net gain, the, the new population was um, expanding and moving into new ponds that were created on that site. But over 90, 90 great crested newts, 500 toads, frogs, and a handful of grass snakes were moved to the conservation area in two phases there. Um, and as I say, this site is, is being monitored um, under license. So that's uh, my second example. Let's just go on to... Um, oh yes, yeah, sorry, before we move on to the, the, the third one, I just wanted to talk a little bit about biodiversity action plans there. Chippen Sobby Quarry has a biodiversity action plan, um, and that plan is contributing to priority habitats for mesotrophic water with the new ponds. There's woodland, there's a ridge, ridge wood there, there's a management plan for ridge wood, there's additional woodland planting on quarry benches, and there's a restoration of grassland throughout the quarry. Um, and on excavation voids and quarry waste tips using native seed mixes there. So those ponds, I mean, they look remarkably established, but they're not that old. Um, they do get going very quickly if you've got sort of um, a focus for colonisation there. Um, and it's recommended that you let nature take its course. You don't start planting them up with, um, with species that you've brought in just because of the risk of contamination. Um, and in fact, most of our alien invasive species now in the UK that are causing problems um, are aquatic or associated with water bodies. Um, so you do not want to be spreading things like uh, New Zealand pygmy wort around um, water bodies because it will soon outcompete our native flora um, and cause problems for or cause management headaches. So some nicely established ponds there that, that look good and are, and are good for, for biodiversity. Okay, so the last case I just wanted to have a look at was um, Masters Quarry in Dorset, another complex of quarries along, basically along the Puddletown Road area near Wareham in Dorset with a, with a different, different owners managed by different operators there. Um, it's a complex of sand and gravel excavation. Some are restored, some have been partially restored, um, some are, are still operational, but these quarries lie within a context of nationally important areas of protected heathland. Um, a heathland support all six of our native reptile species, as well as heathland specialist plants and birds and vertebrates. Um, interestingly, um, it's the quarried areas with these early successional habitats, which include open ground, bare sand, ephemeral pools like we saw, um, vinegar, um, open dry heathland and acid grass, and that often have higher biodiversity than, than some of these established heathlands um, that are now in late successional phase and beginning to, to scrub over. But there you can see some of the specialist heathland species that are found um, on these heathland sites. Um, the one, the plant there on the left is marsh club moss, Lycopodiella inundatum, um, uh, uh, quite a primitive plant that sort of creeps over peaty surfaces. Again, open ground, early successional ground, disturbed ground. Um, and there's quite a, a few colonies down there um, on some of these restored quarry sites. And two rare reptile species. Um, our rarest snake is the smooth snake again found on heathlands, um, and the sand lizard uh, that's, that um, occurs 
um, on heathland sites, um, primarily in Dorset, also occurs in South Merseyside on sand dune habitats, but particularly focused on these heathland sites um, in Dorset. The sand lizard is dependent on sand, obviously the sand, the sand lizard, um, it's not dependent on heath, it needs sand, sand for egg laying, for basking as well, for hibernating, but um, it obviously also needs vegetation for cover, to hide from predators, to hunt, to forage. Um, so it's a combination of open sand and heathland habitat. If it's too shaded, then um, it, it, it won't be found where you have a, a, a heavy or sort of dense cover of pine or gorse. Um, so again, some of these disturbed early successional previously quarried habitats um, on heathland are very good habitats for them. How are we doing for time? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, again, we're, we're focused here on is biodiversity net gain achievable, but one of the things that um, um, Heidelberg Materials do is they run the Quarry Life Awards, um, been doing it for quite a while, the fifth edition um, was last year, and Bath Spa University, we entered into that um, competition, we were successful with our bid to do research on assessing habitat quality parameters and sand properties um, on sand as a breeding site to inform the creation of receptor sites. Because obviously, if you've got quarries that are within such important biodiversity hotspots, um, which support protected species, um, then the, you know, the, your license to continue to extract sand will be dependent on whether you can mitigate adequately for protected species. Um, and because they're um, European protected species, you have to work under license. So they have to be moved to suitable sites. So I suppose that the, the focus of this particular research project was, um, you know, can created receptor sites compare favorably with known established heathland where, where sand lizards have occurred um, traditionally? And so that's what we were trying to find out. We were trying to find out, looking at the sand itself to see you know, what type of sand that the animals actually need, um, because the sand that may be available for restoration for receptor sites where animals will be moved to um, may not be the sand that they need. So what you're doing, if you don't have the right quality of sand, you may be sort of moving the animals to areas where they're not going to persist. The populations will not survive. They'll either move off, disperse to better areas, or they just won't survive, they won't breed. And um, so that was basically the basis of, of that project there. Um, so, in terms of biodiversity, this is important research that, that's actually informing um, how you can create successful receptor sites, and it has knock-on effects not just for rare reptiles, but also for other um, biodiversity that's associated with heathland. So, what we found was that, you know, the, the knowledge of habitat requirements, the knowledge of the ecology of sand lizards on heath heathlands um, and dunes in the UK can inform management um, and the major constraint on heathland sites may limit the availability of open areas bare substrates because as I said most of the um, heathland sites that are well established are subject to um, encroachment from scrub um, which means that the open sand areas are becoming less available Generally, sand quarries will generally lack nutrients. They're generally poor in organic matter. And uh, we found this as part of our, our research and because they're subject to continued disturbance. So this may provide opportunities for longer term sand lizard breeding and hold back um, succession to mature heath due to the lack of organic matter there. So this mosaic of um, um, open sand, um, low scrubby vegetation and um, dwarf shrub heath um, is all important for successful receptor sites. So there's a real potential there to create um, mosaics of vegetation um, and create structural diversity, bare ground um, and open sand in new or enhanced sites. Um, interestingly, when we looked at some of the um, areas where sand lizards were breeding um, in the receptor sites and on um, undisturbed pristine sites, we found that looking at the sand, looking at particle analysis of the sand, the, the, the sand that's available for breeding should incorporate high proportions of medium grade sand. 
Um, it doesn't want to be too silty, too clay, because it gets too compact or too soft because the burrows will collapse. So it is actually important that the right type of sand is used. But the receptor site at Master's Quarry, when we looked at all these parameters, did compare very well with the um, heathland sites where the animals are breeding. Um, so using these sites, expanding these areas um, that have previously been um, maybe covered in trees, if the sand is right underneath, then, and there's heather and um, in the seed bank, then there's a real potential to increase sand lizard recruitment and survivorship um, on these areas. So these recept receptor sites within working quarries are a high quality resource for sand lizards. Um, and provide biodiversity net gain for other heathland specialist plants and animals as well. So I just put that in there really about achieving biodiversity net gain. So what's going on there in these, the, these sites particularly? So you're restoring heathland to favourable condition. Um, your ongoing survey and translocation of protected species under licence. Enhancement of peripheral habitat can be made in non-operational areas to create this open early successional heathland that is really important. And if you look at these photographs here, these are the sites that we were looking at. And the HP one there, the small one um, within the, the white and sort of background there, that is high pit, um, sorry, that is the, the receptor site um, within, within high pit. And you can see how open that is. There's a lot of sort of sandy rides, open sort of vegetation areas as well as sort of um, more densely vegetated areas. Um, so there's, there's, there's lots of open sand um, and habitat that is suitable for um, um, the animals on that site. The other sites there, the nature reserves, Wurgrit Heath, Great Ovens, Northern Heath there, also have open areas of sand. They have lots of heather, mature heather, which the receptor site um, may lack. It's just early successional, it's just getting going. Um, but the way that the sand lizards are utilizing those sites is on created scrapes and open rides, which has to be done through management. So there's this sort of ongoing management need to keep those sites favorable and open, whereas on early successional um, receptor sites created within working quarries, you're, you're at an earlier stage. So there is that opportunity to really um, enhance those areas for early successional heathland species. So we did really well with our project. We, um, um, our research team of staff and students, we won the international award for habitats and species, and we also won the, the national award. So we were really proud of that, of that research, and we hope to be doing some more work on that um, this summer. So real positive gains and positive um, evidence-based research on biodiversity and how it can be enhanced and net gain within, within quarries. So um, I've been talking for quite a long time. Um, I just wanted to finish with this. Now, these are not, not my words. There's something from New Scientist. I just saw it recently, um, and I thought you might be interested um, in that. So with under this sort of scenario of one million threatened species and the effects of human impacts, we can't save everything. How do we prioritize? So the article in, in the New Scientist is saying, forget pristine habitats for biodiversity, save abandoned quarries. If you're interested in that article, I strongly recommend you read that. So these unglamorous, geologically diverse landscapes from scrubland to exhausted mines can be um, uh, havens for biodiversity. Um, so they might not look much, but neglected quarries um, may be the key to ensuring long-term survival of some of our species. And that, that's an article in um, New Scientist there. Uh, just out of interest, that quarry is um, a disused quarry in Chefois in Western France. Um, it's got marsh, it's got woodland, trees and shrubs. Um, it's got high diversity of mosses and ferns. Um, and it's, it's a real biodiversity hotspot there. Um, yeah, so that was uh, 4th of September 2019, that article there, and, and the link is, is there um, on the slide. Um, but I can um, uh, post in the chat if anyone's interested. Okay, so to finish, um, can the quarry industry achieve sustainability? So I think from what we've looked at there, looking at the evidence, the science base, 
Um, we can say that in terms of biodiversity net gain, definitely um, you can um, achieve high returns for biodiversity in some of these sites through a combination of policy, legislation, frameworks, corporate social responsibility, and stakeholder engagement. It builds on what has gone before. This idea of no net loss wasn't good enough. What we're looking at is biodiversity net gain, however that can be achieved, whatever the flaws of the DEFRA metric. Um, there are good examples of how biodiversity net gain has been achieved in the past and is being continuing to be, be achieved. The case studies I've shown you illustrate the progress made and this importance of science in underpinning conservation solutions, but it does depend on funding, corporate and political will, um, and we're moving towards net zero. Some um, uh, targets are 2030, some are 2050, but we are moving towards net zero. So there's a whole um, area of reducing carbon emissions and working towards these green credentials within, within, within the industry. Okay, well, I think I've, I've finished now, so um, I will shut up. <laughs> allow, uh, if you've want, got any questions, I'd be really happy to, to answer those or try Fantastic. to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. So uh, I'd invite everyone either to raise your hand using the reaction function or put your um, question into the meeting chat. And just while we're waiting for those to come through, I'm happy to open up with a question. Um, Stephanie, how does the biodiversity net gain matrix kind of capture the variety and the diversity of habitats that are often created in kind of quarry scale landscapes? And how do we prevent ourselves just going for the cheapest or kind of, mm. in terms of points, the most effective option? It is going to be um, challenging, I think. I think some of the criticism of it has been the fact that it's, it's looking at small scale um, uh, habitat creation when the moves are now towards landscape scale, which is where quarries would fit in this landscape scale restoration, improving connectivity, large scale restoration. Um, some of that may be off site, some of that may be linking a network of quarries. So the biodiversity metric is kind of focused on um, habitats that um, are important, obviously, and important to, to um, to retain or to recreate, but also some of these early successional open mosaic habitats are, are, are very difficult. And I think the it will be trial and error. It's so new. Um, I don't know how it's going to pan out. I'm not an expert on, on using the metric, uh, but these are some of the criticisms and concerns I've been made aware of through ecologists and environmentalists who've been testing it, and also um, generally, you know, the, the sort of environmental sector. Um, but I think the, the hope is that it isn't, it's the start. Natural England is saying it's the start to doing this. It's trying to sort of move away, I suppose, from the philosophy of no net loss, whereas maybe, you know, within the quarrying industry, you've not been focused on no net loss, you've been focused on gain, biodiversity, net gain, landscape scale restoration. But it's it, it's something that's going to have to be dealt with statutory. Um, I, I don't know how it's going to work out. But there's these ideas of habitat banking. Um, you know, as landowners, you're creating land in advance, um, preparing it for um, um, biodiversity and again, that will be taken in, and that will be there'll be credits there. Um, so I think there are ways it can be used. Um, you know more applicable to quiz, but it may be in that direction, maybe to do with habitat banking. Um, but that's all I can say, really. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Have we got any other questions around the room? As I say, please feel free to put those in the chat, or if you prefer, you can uh, turn your camera on, give us a wave, or use the little reaction tool to uh, put your hand up. You haven't got anything in the chat, Otto. Oh, Steve's just put his hand up, though. Yeah, Steve. Uh, you're on mute, Steve, if you could just uh, take it off. Hi, Steph. Yeah, I couldn't resist coming back on vinegar because that was the, the specifics of that were part of the, the site that was restored, if I can put it that way, you'd already think had recovered because it was all woodland and banks and, and soil and lots going on there. And it would have been so interesting because we actually cleared the whole site. It was it was six months of woodland clearance, basically, mm. and burning gorse and clearing it away and burying all the ash so that you 
kept low value nutrient soils. And if they'd have done a before and after me, you know, measurement on that, it would have been just so interesting to see that. And it was incredible to see the way that stuff came back in. You, you mentioned a few, there was uh, blue stud butterflies that hadn't even been seen in that area for years and, and all sorts of things, insects in the ponds and what have you. The other, what I was gonna ask the question though was, um, on the, uh, the, the table, the chart that you produced at the beginning, which showed the various uh, impacts in, into uh, um, uh, by the environment, and you, you showed agriculture as being 69%. How interesting would it be to actually do that for the quarrying industry and see whether we were 69% or whether we were a lot <laughs> better than even that? Uh, yeah. Agriculture always gets flagged up um, as, as sort of being measured, and we, we just don't seem to collect that data in the quarrying industry mm. globally mm. or in, in the UK. Mm. And yet we're just as disparate as the agricultural industry. I don't know why we can't do it really. Mm. Yes, it is, it is surprising. I mean, if you look at that in detail, um, there, is, there is a breakdown. Obviously, it, it is, it's habitat loss, um, land use change. I suppose that's where it, it would come under land use change. Um, so from something that maybe was um, natural habitat then becomes a working quarry. So that's that's the impact there, the driver for biodiversity loss. But you've got to look at that in the context of restoration, haven't you? Um, you know, whereas agricultural management, the impact that that figure sixty nine percent, what they're looking at now in terms of trying to improve that loss are these environmental land management schemes. You know, where it, it, it's not being farmers are not being paid for you know, the number of animals they keep or the numbers of acres under wheat. It, it's, you know, public money for public good. What can they do to enhance biodiversity? So it's this whole shift under the, um, the Agricultural Act and the Environment Act um, that's going to change the way we farm, I think, as well. Um, and um, but, but yes, yeah, yes, you're right. I mean, looking at how this would break down when it comes to the impact of quarrying. But but I suppose what's perceived here is that agricultural management, you stop farming and nature comes back. Is it as simple as that? <laughs> you stop quarrying. Does nature come back? You have to do something. You can walk away. You can rewild and let nature take its course and achieve biodiversity. But in other instances, for example, the example of Heathland, you walk away from Heathland you get scrub, you get woodland. Ecological succession is driving that towards woodland, which, you know, woodland's good, trees are good, but at the same time, if that's happening on heathland, you're gonna lose all the biodiversity that's associated with those heathland habitats. And, you know, that, that um, early successional, highly disturbed um, open areas um, are very, very important, you know, in, 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 in those instances. I don't know if that answers your question, it's sort of a bit of a discussion really. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. We've got a, uh, a question coming from the chat. So if abandoned quarries are such a good source of biodiversity, is it prudent for mineral companies to retain them to balance the impact of their active operations? And that's from Mark Pittman. Oh, okay. So um, in terms of, I, I suppose you're thinking of maybe, you know, once they're used, then selling them off maybe, um, or they go on to other users or other owners. Um, but, um, Yes, I mean, I think there's lots of examples where abandoned quarries um, do, um, I mean, sand and gravel areas, nature reserves, um, there's a sort of Needingworth reed bed, you know, project going on. Um, yeah, so uh, there, there is certainly, in, I think, huge scope in having these areas and working them in such a way or restoring them in such a way, or managing them in such a way that they, they become very good for biodiversity. And eventually, you know, maybe they can um, reach the sort of level of quality that means they could be nature reserves. But it's generally abandoned quarries. Um, it's, it's something different from something that is actively restored, I think, isn't it? Um, so you do have, I, I'm sure there are health and safety issues associated with abandoning hard rock quarries where, you know, they fill up with water and what you've got basically is a very, very deep lake and very, very steep sides with not much going on in deep water and steep sides, apart from maybe a few ravens and maybe peregrine falcons. So, yeah, it, it depends very much on the site, doesn't it? And um, the nature of that site, the context of it as well, how, how well connected that is to other areas. 
does it form a complex within a mosaic of woodland, cliff, cliffs, water, or is it is it uh, an abandoned quarry sitting within an intensely arable landscape, uh, which could then become something that is 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 a health and safety issue? Or, yeah, so I think there's lots of things that need to be considered there, aren't there? That's great. Thanks, Stephanie. Got another question coming from the, the chat. It's from David Brook. Does the legislation in, impose any time scale on achieving the biodiversity net gain and on actually maintaining it? Yeah, well, I think um, if you're going to be, I'm aware that the um, the land banking, the habitat banking, if you're securing land um, for biodiversity net gain that's off site, this is when you're sort of compensating, I suppose, taking the compensation route. Um, you have to make sure that that land is safeguarded for 30 years, a minimum of 30 years. That's what the legislation says. So, you you know, if you're going to be saying, you know, we, we can't avoid, um, we, we can't mitigate enough, we have to compensate. So we're going to be, as landowners, we've got this land over here that we've been planting trees, been digging ponds, been growing hedgerows or whatever for the past 10 years. So this is now going to be our offset our habitat bank and that gains you credits within the biodiversity net gain metric but there has to be an agreement there has to be a legal agreement there and the time scale on that is is 30 years um with those those it has to be um secured for 30 years but i think it, it is so new it will all be we'll, we'll see it all in practice a very new way of doing things and um, so it's going to pan out over the next few years isn't it really to see how well it works and, and, and whether it achieves what it's designed to achieve. Definitely be interesting. Um, I can't see any more questions or hands up, but I do have one more myself. Um, you've mentioned about these quarry faces, which are obviously gets quite challenging in the hard rock sites and where you've got quarry faces and benches and you're sort of limited in what you can do, I guess. But how do those kind of bare rock quarry faces and benches uh, fare in terms of the biodiversity? Um, mm. And how can we improve that in the hard rock sites? <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm, I suppose the, the example I was aware of, and I have worked on a, on a project with Vaspar University at Chicken Sobby as part of the, the Quarry Life Award. Um, we looked at the water bodies, and that was a challenging one because it is within carboniferous limestone quarries, deep quarries, steep sides. You know, what can you do to improve biodiversity? But at the same time, within that matrix of deep quarries, you've also got the biodiversity interest on the tip areas. So it seems to me that most of that biodiversity is not in the quarries itself. It's actually on the periphery. So what can you do with the quarries? I mean, there's um, bench planting, um, but that's something that's been done. You know, it's, it's putting trees there. Um, what we talked about is maybe restoration blasting, um, where you're actually blasting to create a slope, a shallower slope. Um, and um, you're, I suppose you're infilling certain areas as well to, 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 to uh, the, the interest in the biodiversity will be at the lake edges, won't it? Thinking of Watley Quarry here as an example, um, you're not going to get much in the deep water, but if you've got edges, peripheral margins, that you can um, improve in terms of um, allowing the uh, margins to colonise with reed beds or maybe not reed beds, but peripheral marginal plants, by raising that depth um, and um, you might get something quite quite nice and biodiverse around the edges um, combined with a mixed use of that particular lake. Um, on the, um, if you could do a bit of restoration blasting as well, then you're reducing those slopes, you're having a scree slope as well as terraced, terraced slopes. So birds like peregrine falcons and ravens um, will use those. Um, and combined with areas of steep woodland, once that gets established, I mean, maybe there's work to be done. I know we did another project looking at ash and wood and ancient woodland, looking at how you can create ancient woodland ground flora on created woodlands, you know, within on, on quarry bench planting. How can you make that more interesting? Um, there may be a way you can improve the soil with propagules of, um, you know, woodland ground floor rather than that metal and dock and dark shady thing you get I'm sure that can be improved in some way so there's there's probably quite a lot of things that that, that can be done but I think in terms of the actual landform um you you're stuck with those terraces unless there's some way you can do restoration blasting to to, to have a shallower face um or, or reduce that steepness and then in, uh, improve the shallow the shallower edges of that lake 
by creating a gentle shelving entrance rather than a you know a precipitous drop all the way around. So that was basically what we were looking at at potentially at Chip and Sobri. But yeah, in those cases, the biodiversity interests will be on the periphery and on the on the tip land, the restored tip land. That's great, thanks. And I think we'll make this our final question. It's from Rod Noble. Is there a preferred medium for the vertebrates in sand and gravel quarries, as so much of the material available for rest restoration tends to be poor quality silts and clays? Yes, this is one thing that we were looking at because um, basically the sand that you want for these sort of sand banks and areas for sand as a breeding is the coarse sand that you probably want to sell. <laughs> so it's a matter of um, having um, uh, maybe a greater understanding of, of what are the limits. Okay, we know that that a certain particle size is 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 particularly good. Coarse to medium grain sand is good. Um, you don't want it too fine. You don't want it too clay. I think it's a matter of maybe seeing how much you can mix with that to create stuff that that sanders will be able to use. And that's that's the example there. So there was a concern that you know previously to, to the research we were doing was that you know we would say okay we need some sandy banks for basking and for egg laying and then the quarry would come in and put these sandy banks but it wasn't the right sand it was too clay and it would just all scrub up within a season with nettles and docks and bramble no heather in sight no sand lizard burrows because it was just that they couldn't use it so I think that that's the case I mean if you want to have success in in restoration um, you you have to listen to the science and you have to say, yep, yeah, that's no good, but but this is good, but maybe we can do a certain amount of mixing to have maybe the surface. So sand is a burrow is maybe 15 centimetres deep, so maybe we can put something underneath to improve the topography. It doesn't have to be great, but we can then put, you know, a 20 centimetre layer of good sand on, on the top. Um, that will allow them to make sense. So it's all that, that, that's what I suppose we're talking about, sort of researching those things and looking for the evidence to what actually works. Because there's no point in having these, you know, these areas that are set aside for biodiversity if they're not going to work, you know, if, if they're not what those animals need or they're not the right condition, they're not providing the right conditions.